Hi, I'm Luis Herrera Estrella. I'm director of the National Laboratory of Genomics for Biodiversity in Irapuato, Mexico. And I'll be talking to you about plant nutrition and sustainable agriculture. Uh, I will be dividing my presentations into three sections. One talking about uh, plant nutrition in general, the second about phosphorus, an essential plant nutrient, and in the third part about the use of a genetic engineering to design an environmentally friendly phosphorus fertilization system. So I will start talking about some very important issues that we need to consider in, in food production. New projections by the United Nations indicate that the world's population might reach over 9 billion people by 2050. This will be mainly in developing countries and not so much in industrialized countries that have a more steady, stabilized growth. This will not only be an increase in population, but there will be also a switch in the percentage of people living in urban regions and rural zones. So before, in the 50s, most of the people live in rural zones and they were doing activities related to food production. But in 2050, about only one third to one fourth of the people will, live in, will be living in rural areas and will be involved in, in food production. So less people producing food, more people consuming high levels of calories in the cities. So to achieve the goal of satisfying the food needs of people, we need to double food production in the same cultivated area. We cannot increase cultivated area because we will have to deforest and we have to uh, destroy jungle and forest to, to be able to incorporate more area to cultivation. So we need to increase production but maintaining the same cultivated area. So we need to increase about 69% of the calorie intake by 2050. And to increase this 69%, we need to double for production because the, the global meat demand is increasing and we need to produce feed for animals to be growing. So we, we will increase the level of beef, pork, poultry that people is consuming. And because these animals are not very efficient, particularly beef, in the conversion of energy from uh, feed into meat, uh, we will need to increase more the, the, the production of agricultural products. To reach the projected needs in food production, we need to increase plant productivity. So this graph shows in the green line the level of increase in productivity that we currently have using the technology we have in hand. So even though things have improved in the past and we have better crops, and we have better ways of irrigation and better ways of fertilization, we still have a gap in productivity that is required to reach the amount of food we will need by 2050. And to, to close this gap, we will need to make use of all the technology that we can develop to increase uh, crop yield um, per area unit. So we need to increase food production but we need to de decrease the environmental impact of agriculture. So agriculture is one of the activities, human activities that causes more environmental problems. For instance, 24% of the greenhouse gas emissions are produced by agriculture. 37% of the Earth's land mass is just for agricultural purposes, either as for cropping or grassland for cattle or other animals. And over 70%, between 70 and 80% of the fresh water use in the world is done for agriculture. So we need to reduce greenhouse emission. We need to optimize the use of the air land mass for cropping and, and grassing. And also we need to decrease and make more efficient the use of water because this is going to be one of the most limiting uh, factors for the future of, of humanity. So how can we make agriculture more sustainable? We need to increase plant productivity. We need to use all technology available to increase the capacity of plants to produce uh, grains and fruits and biomass. So we need to use traditional breeding. We need to use genetic engineering, genetically modified organisms 
and new breeding technologies such, such as genome editing that are promising major changes to incorporate a new traits into, into crops. At the same time, we need to increase yield but reduce agrochemical use. We need to optimize fertilization schemes, so we need to reduce the application of chemical fertilizer and increase the use of, of organic and biofertilizers. Biofertilizers are bacteria that help plants to be more efficient in fertilizer use. We need to reduce also the use of pesticides and herbicides. We need more food, but we also need healthier food. We need food with less chemicals. So we need to use bio, biocontrol agents that prevent uh, diseases and pests in, in, in crops, biological and genetic weed control systems as well to reduce herbicide use. To optimize fertilization scheme, we need to understand plant nutrition. That's why it's important to learn what the plant needs and how we can optimize it so that we can uh, make a more sustainable agriculture. But also we need to, to understand how plants interact with, with soil microbes because microbes play a, a very important role in the capacity of the plant to take up, to assimilate nutrients from the soil and also how fast it grows using these, these minerals. And we also need to understand the molecular, physiological and developmental mechanisms that plants use to optimize nutrient uptake and use. And just some basic concepts about nutrition. There are two types of organisms in, in, in our planet. Autotrophs that produce their own food. These are essentially photosynthetic organisms, plants, algae, and, and photosynthetic bacteria. There are also a few microbes that can obtain their food using chemical energy. And heterotrophs that get their food from other organs. So these are animals, including humans, fungi, insects, and so on. So all these organisms feed on autotrophs. So we need to uh, make sure that these get enough nutrients to grow so that we can feed heterotrophs. And the, the ecosystem uh, allows that every organism is connected to its environment by a continuous exchange of energy and nutrients and environmental cues that make them interact uh, with the other organisms to maintain an ecological equilibrium. So why is plant nutrition important? Because food production requires an adequate crop plant nutrition. If we feed well our plants, if they get enough nutrients, we will have optimal yields. This in turn impacts food production. We need more production and we need healthier food. So, and to make a sustainable agriculture, we need to consider not only the environmental part, but also the social and economical part of a sustainable agriculture. People doing agricultural activities needs to make a living in a way that is satisfactory and has the same standards as people living in urban areas. It has to be also economically feasible because we can make an environmentally friendly agriculture that is economically not feasible because the productivity is not sufficient to supply enough food. So we need to make an, a, a, a sustainable agriculture in social, economical, and environmental terms. So some important aspects of plant nutrition. Uh, the plant organic mass is produced from atmospheric CO2 and water from the soil. So most of the carbohydrates that form part of a plant come from these two uh, compounds. But also plants require mineral nutrients from the soil. So they take up through the roots minerals and they are essential for plant growth. There are about 15 organic elements found in plants, but they are not all essential. An element is essential only if it's required to complete the life cycle of a plant. Where do plant nutrients come from? So water and essential minerals are taken up from the soil by the root system. So essentially all water and minerals are taken up by the root from the soil. Carbon dioxide diffuses into the leaves from the atmosphere through pores in the leaves that are called stomata. So CO2 enters the leaves and through the process of photosynthesis is used to produce carbohydrates. 
a large portion of the water that's taken up by plants is evaporated through leaves to facilitate the, the, the transport of minerals from the roots to the upper parts of the plant. So not all the water needed by plants is maintaining the plant. A large percentage is evaporated through a streaming process to help nutrients go up to the upper plants of the upper parts of the plant. About 95% of the drag weight of a plant is organic matter, only 5% is unorganic. Most of the material in a plant is carbohydrates, such as cellulose. We can see this very large tree in which most of the matter is, is cellulose composing the cell walls of the plant. Therefore, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are the most abundant elements in the dry weight of a plant because they form part of, carbo of carbohydrate. However, some organic molecules contain nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphate. Therefore, these elements are also relatively abundant in plants. So how do we define an essential nutrient? So an essential nutrient is required for the plant to complete its life cycle, as I said before. But it has to be shown that the specific effects of a deficiency can only be corrected by supplying that same element. And the element must be directly involved in plant physiology, independently of possible effects on the microbiology microbiological or chemical soils conditions. To date, 17 elements have been identified as essential nutrients for plant growth. Nine of these are macronutrients that are required in relatively large amounts. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and sulfur. And eight are considered micronutrients because they are required in very small amounts. These are chlorine, iron, zinc, manganese, boron, copper, nickel, and molybdenum. There are other elements such as sodium, silice, and selenium that are required for maximum biomass production in some plant species, and therefore can be considered as functional nutrients but since they are not needed by all plant species, they cannot be considered essential nutrients. So how is CO2 and carbon used as a nutrient in plants? So this is through the process of photosynthesis. Plants use the energy of sunlight and water to produce sugars. So CO2 enters the plant leaf through the estomata. It reaches the chloroplast, which is an organelle in the cell that takes care of photosynthesis. So sunlight and water are used to produce high energy compounds that through the cycle, a cycle called Calvin cycle, are used to produce sugars. And these sugars are later on converted into amino acid lipids and all the, the organic molecules that are present in a plant. So among the, the essential nutrients, nitrogen is one of the most important. It's the most abundant element in the Earth's atmosphere is the fourth most abundant element in a plant after carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and often is the, lim the most limited nutrient for plant growth. Nitrogen is essential for plants because this, it is a component of amino acids, nucleic acids, chlorophyll, and many other small molecules that participate in the biochemical processes of a plant. Phosphorus is also a very important nutrient. It's the fifth most abundant element in a plant and is the first or second most commonly limited nutrient for plant growth in agricultural land. It plays important roles in energy and information transfer, as it is component of DNA, RNA, phospholipids, and also as part of high energy compounds such as ATP. Small uh, micronutrients uh, have either structural activities or they can act as, as catalytics in, in, in enzyme reactions. So boron acts as a stru structural component of cell walls by, by linking cellulose fibers in the cell wall. As some other nutrients remain in, in ionic form and help enzymatic activities and maintain osmotic uh, pressure. So for instance, potassium is a cofactor for over 40 enzymes and is the principal cation to maintain cell turgor and control of membrane potential. Calcium contributes 
to cell wall and membrane structure, and also acts in signaling processes for different biochemical reactions in the, in the plant cell. Magnesium is a cofactor for enzymes uh, required for phosphate transfer, and it is also a structural component of chlorophyll. Here we show the molecule of chlorophyll in which magnesium coordinates a, a, a forfeiting-like ring structure. There are also uh, micronutrients that act as redox agents. These are uh, involved in the transfer of electrons in, in photosynthesis and also in the respiratory chain to produce high-energy compounds in the physiology of the, of the plant and other organisms. Now, plant nutrition involves two major components. One is nutrient uptake, in which plant takes up nutrients from the soil, and the other one is how efficient is the plant to utilize these nutrients to produce biomass, seeds, and, and fruits. So nutrient uptake, nutrient uptake efficiency has several components. One of them is root architecture. Root architecture influences what is the capacity of the plant to explore the soil to acquire nutrients. Uh, also, the presence of transporters in the roots. We need nitrogen transporters, we need phosphate transporters, sulfur transporters. The interaction with microbes that help the plant to be more efficient in nutrient uptake. And also, how much exudates, organic molecules the plant exudates to interact with microbes. Nutrient utilization, on the other hand, also involves different processes. So, for instance, transport from the roots into the upper parts of the plant, how efficient the plant can transport these molecules, how it regulates the homeostasis of different nutrients, and also what is the efficiency of assimilating and mobilizing these nutrients from older parts of the plant to younger parts, and finally, for seed production and fruit production. How efficient, how much biomass can the plant produce uh, with the same amount of nutrient. <clears throat> now, how does uh, nutrients get into, into the plant? So, nutrients are, the pre and are present in the form of ions in the soil, and they enter the plant through the roots, through the epidermal cells of the roots. And a large portion of the epidermal cells of the root form these protrusions that are called root hairs. These root hairs uh, comprise about 70 to 80 percent of the root surface, and it is here in these root hairs in which nutrients enter the plant. So we have transporters for ammonium and nitrate, we have transporters for phosphate, we have transporters for phosphate and all other nutrients, and these nutrients are transported from uh, root hairs into the rest of the root until they reach the xylem, and then through the xylem are sent to the rest of the plant. So, how do the ions get? They get into the plant through transporters. These trans transporters can be uh, facilitators that just help the, 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 the ion enter the cell if the concentration is higher outside than inside. But in most of the cases, the concentration of the nutrient is lower in the outside of the cell than inside. So, we need transporters that require a, a potential uh, hydrogen potential in the membrane, or, or, or that needs energy in the form of ATP to transport a nitrate, magnesium, sodium, calcium, uh, zinc, and phosphate. So, how much nutrient do we need for a plant growth? So, if we have very little nutrient, the plant almost doesn't grow. It achieves a little bit of growth from whatever is stored in the seed. If we increase the amount of nutrient, we will see that there is a, a, an increase in growth and yield until it reaches a maximum in which if we keep adding the nutrient, it will not help the plant to produce more. But eventually, we will reach a zone in which if we add too much nutrient, it will be toxic, it will become toxic. So this is particularly important for certain uh, <clears throat> nutrients such as phosphate, that if we uh, supply to the plant in, in excessive amounts, can become toxic for plant growth. So now, what happens if we don't have sufficient nutrients in the soil? The plant suffers, and you can see the symptoms on the, on the plant. So nutrient deficiency symptoms appear when one or more nutrients are present in limiting concentrations. And deficiency can occur 
not because the nutrient is not in sufficient amounts in the soil, but because of the soil chemistry doesn't uh, allow the presence of the nutrient in a form that is available for plant uptake. Here we see, for instance, the, the symptoms of deficiency of, of manganese on leaves. So the most important mineral deficiencies in plants are those caused by nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium deficiencies. And that's why these three compounds are the most often uh, elements used in fertilizers. So a healthy plant looks green, shiny, but if you have phosphorus deficiency, you see the accumulation of a, of a purple uh, staining in the edges of the leaf, which is due to the accumulation of anthocyanins, which uh, directly point out to a phosphorus deficiency. If you have potassium deficiency, you see the, the, the dying of the edges of the leaf. And if you have nitrogen deficiency, you can see this yellowing of the central part near the, the central vein of, of the leaf. So the nutrition of the plant is not only determined by the availability of nutrients from the soil, but bacteria and soil microbes play a very important role in plant nutrition. So there are bacteria that are endophytic bacteria. They are inside the plant. They live inside the plant. And this bacteria is associated intimately with, with, with the plant. And it's been proposed that these plants can be even, this bacteria can even be inherited uh, through the seed to the next generation. <clears throat> the plant also produces root exudates that attract beneficial microbes in, that help the plant to have a better nutrition. For instance, the plant associates with mycorrhiza and nitrogen-fixing bacteria that help them provide the plant with uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. The plant also associates with plant growth promoting bacteria, bacteria that produces substances that make the plant healthier and promote their growth and, and productivity. There are also bacteria that help the plant to get nutrients from the soil because they solubilize uh, compounds with, which are not available for plant uptake. And of course, it can also associate with pathogens which are detrimental for plant nutrition and plant growth. So the metabolism of bacteria, of soil bacteria, is very important because one of the things that can happen is that these bacteria can make nitrogen available for plants. One uh, very important issue to consider is that plants cannot use nitrogen in the form of nitrogen 2, the, the, the elemental nitrogen that is present in the atmosphere. So although nitrogen is very abundant in, in, in our planet, plants cannot directly use from the atmosphere it first has to be converted into ammonium or nitrate. And th th this is being done by nitrogen-fixing bacteria that restock uh, nitrogen minerals in the soil by converting uh, atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia via a process called nitrogen fixation. This, plant, this bacteria can be free living in the soil, or they can be associated in, 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 in with the plant in symbiosis. The metabolism of soil bacteria makes nitrogen available in the plant and helps to have the nitrogen cycle. So atmospheric nitrogen is fixed by nitrogen-fixing bacteria that converts it into ammonia. Soil bacteria can also produce ammonia from organic uh, materials present in the soil. This ammonium is then converted into nitrate by nitrifying bacteria this nitrate is taken up by the root, through the root hairs, and then converted into ammonia, which is then used to produce amino acids and other compounds inside the plant. But this nitrogen can also be converted into uh, elemental nitrogen by denitrifying bacteria. This elemental nitrogen goes to the atmosphere and completes the cycle, starting again for nitrogen fixation. So those the presence of soil microbes and the role of soil microbes in plant nutrition is quite important because they can supply nitrogen to the plant. This interaction between plants and, and bacteria can be even in, the, in, in a symbiotic interaction in which bacteria help the plant by fixing nitrogen. This is particularly important for legumes such as peas and beans 
that form symbiotic relationships with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. The bacteria supplies the, 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 the plant with fixed nitrogen for assimilation into organic compounds such as amino acids, and the plant in turn provides the bacteria with carbohydrates and other organic compounds to sustain bacterial growth. Legumes form nodules in which the bacteria lives inside, they fix nitrogen and exchange organic compounds with the plant. So this is a picture. I guess we can see these uh, round protrusions in the root. They are called nodules, and in these nodules is where nitrogen fixation takes place. The fi nitrogen fixing bacteria lives inside these nodules and help the plant to get nitrogen in the form of organic compounds. This topic has been presented in, in, in detail by Professor Sharon Long in this series of iBiology, so I recommend you to see the presentation of Professor Sharon Long to understand the details of the molecular biology of nitrogen fixation. So there is other type of organisms that help plants to, to improve nutrition. These are mycorrhizae. They are symbiotic association of roots with fungi that enhance plant nutrition. The fungi increases the root surface area to increase water uptake and nutrient uptake. So it's like the root gets enhanced to cover a much larger area because the fungi grows much faster than the root. The fungi also secretes growth factors that stimulate root growth and branching, and also produces antibiotics that protect the plant against uh, infections by bacteria and other fungi. In turn, the association uh, provides the fungi with, ben with a beneficial in in environment and a steady supply of sugars to grow. Mycorrhiza takes two major forms, ectomycorrhizae and endomycorrhizae. In the ectomycorrhizae, the fungi covers the root and allows the plant to have a, a larger area of nutrient absorption. And some IFA grows into the uh, spaces between root cells, but they don't enter the root, the root cell. In the case of the endomycorrhizae, this endomycorrhizae actually enters the cell and they, pro they produce this uh, ramified structures that are called arbusculus, and that's where the exchange of nutrients and carbon takes place between the, the fungal cell and, and the plant cell, helping the plant to, to absorb more water and nutrients. So these extensions serve as a, as, as a way of being more efficient in exploring the soil to have better access to water and nutrients. Mycorrhiza nodules have an evolutionary relationship. Mycorrhiza evolved 400 million years ago during the adaptation of, of aquatic plants to land. They probably played a very crucial role to help aquatic plants adapt to the low level of nutrient availability in the soil. We should remember that these primitive aquatic plants had very primitive root systems and they require an association with mycorrhizae to be able to extract nutrients from the soil. Root nodules in legume originated between 65 and 150 million years ago during the early evolution of angiosperms, and they are being proposed to have an, a, a common evolutionary origin because the genes activated during the initial stages of, of root nodule formation and, and mycorrhizae interaction are the same. And mutations in these genes affect not one, but both processes. So suggesting that they have uh, used the same system that was uh, established for mycorrhizae, that then was used by uh, the interaction with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. The root microbiome is much more than rhizobium and mycorrhizae. If we consider that uh, the plant has between 37 and 400 and, and 40,000 genes. And we now should consider that it interacts with fungi, with nematodes, with arthropods, with bacteria, with algae. And we should take into account that those, all these organisms play an important role in helping the plant achieve an optimal nutrition and also to, to, to sustain, sustain better growth. So this should be considered as the whole genome of a plant in which we, we should take into account not only the genes present in, in, the, in the plant genome, but also all the genes that are present in the microbes that are associated in what we call the root or the plant microbiome, because they will provide uh, um, 
biochemical and physiological functions that are needed for optimal plant growth. So the, 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 the root microbiome contributes to plant nutrition, health, and development. So there are microbes that help the plant to grow and develop better. They activate the immune system so that they are better prepared to withstand infection by pathogens. They also uh, help plant to better tolerate drought. They assist the plant to enhance nutrient uptake. And they can also directly protect the plant against pathogens because they can produce antibiotics and enzymes that actually act against these pathogens. So as in the case of humans, the microbiome associated with plants plays an essential role for the physiology and survival of plants. And we have to think about this as, as, a, as a major tool for agriculture because it is being proposed that if we have the right microbiome, we could enhance plant productivity and achieve a more sustainable agriculture because it will help us to reduce the, the, the need of water and fertilizers, herbicides, and, and, in, and pesticides required for optimal agricultural production if we associate the right microbiome with a plant. Here is just an example. These are coffee plants in a nursery grown with a biofertilizer bio and chemical fertilizer alone. They have the same amount of chemical fertilizer applied in both cases, but when the plant is inoculated with a bacteria and a fungi, they sustain much better growth and produce more biomass than when you add only the chemical fertilizer. So this shows the importance of, of the presence of the right microbiome associated with the plant to achieve uh, better growth and also to have healthier plants. So nutrient availability in the soil is an important issue that we should consider to produce a more sustainable agriculture. Nutrients are naturally present in all soils and bacteria and fungi assist in nutrient uptake. So we have to take care of understanding what is the role of the microbiome and how we can use this to, to enhance plant productivity. Often nutrients have low availability in the soil and limit plant growth and productivity. So we need to make sure that the soil conditions are sufficient to, to have a, 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 an efficient supply of nutrients to the plant. We should remember that harvesting plant biomass or seeds remove nutrients from the soils that need to be replaced. So what do we have to do? We need to apply fertilizers to supplement soil with the nutrients to achieve high yields. This is to replace what we have removed. Each time we harvest, we remove nutrients from the soil, we have to replace them. So, and to achieve a sustainable agriculture, we need to fully understand plant nutrition to design a more sustainable agriculture. What is the best form to apply fertilizers, which is the chemical form of the fertilizer that we need to apply, how we need to apply the fertilizer, and how is the association of plants with microbes necessary to achieve a better uh, nutrient uh, uptake and utilization. So that's all what I wanted to tell you about this introductory talk about plant nutrition. And I just showed a picture of, of my students that have worked with me and discuss many of these issues uh, for the past few years in, in, in my laboratory. Thank you very much.